Well, I'm so pleased that we're able to do this here. I want to thank Town Hall and uh, all of the people who have put this together. Uh, Ashley Sheldon, Katie Sewell, uh, any number of other people who have been working with us and our, our uh, events coordinators tonight. Um, and we're honored to be here because, as you know, uh, this is in the wake of the current administration's first 100 days. And it's one day after International Workers' Day, May 1st, which uh, originally honored a strike and kind of a violent strike called the Haymarket Affair, which was uh, agitating, uh, demonstrating for better working conditions for laborers in the 19th century. Uh, eventually, it became known as May Day, and it's been, it is an international holiday. I mean, most countries in the world uh, honor May Day as the, um, you know, that's the main Labor Day. Um, and, uh, but it kind of fell out of favor in this country because we were very uh, strongly anti-communist, so we had to have a different Labor Day. But in the wake of this 20, uh, 2008 Great Recession, which is still ongoing for a number of workers and former home homeowners, uh, the loss of full-time living wage jobs, to automation, outsourcing, offshoring, and the shrinking of unions and the disappearing of union jobs, and the growth of what we now call the gig economy, right? May Day is once again becoming a key date. So we were really glad to be able to present here in, uh, in town hall one day later. Um, and now thinking back to the earlier administration's um, first number of days in office, on the 29th of January 2009, 10 days into his first term, President Obama signed the Lilly Ledbetter Fair Pay Act. Uh, this was his first legislative act after taking off office. Um, we were, I was, I was intrigued by this because I don't know if you know anything about the story of Lily Ledbetter. I'll tell you just briefly. She was, this is her picture on the cover, by the way, of the book. She's looking very, in very much campaign mode. But what she was doing uh, for 20 years was working for Goodyear Tire and Rubber, uh, one of their plants in northern Alabama. She was what they called an area manager, not one of the, the guys working in the, you know, in the factory making the tires. But she was, uh, she was the only woman working in the, uh, as a night manager, one of the very few women working in that factory. Just about the time she was getting ready to retire, uh, someone anonymously slipped her some documents that showed the pay of other area managers, all of whom were male, some of whom were younger than she, whom she had hired and trained. And they were all getting paid somewhere, anywhere between 20 and 40 percent more than she was. Uh, she, of course, was, you know, shocked and angered by that. And so she filed a complaint with the Equal, Oppor Equal Employment Opportunity Commission. Uh, the case went to trial. She won the case, winning several million dollars of back pay and damages. Because, you know, of course, if you're paid less, you get less Social Security. And she was looking ahead at her, at her, uh, her Social Security benefits that would begin, you know, soon. In any case, uh, she won the case and she thought she would get this money, but Goodyear, which had very deep pockets, partly because of all the money they withheld from her, uh, they, they, uh, they appealed and she lost in the appellate court on a technicality. Then it went to the Supreme Court and the same thing happened, a five to four decision. The case, um, the technicality, the same technicality as in the appellate court was that she should have filed her complaint within 180 days of the first unequal paycheck. Well, how do you do, know that? How do you do that when you don't know what other people are be, being paid? Because to discuss your pay and compare notes was a firing offense. So, 
you know, she was, she was just out of luck. And, uh, but uh, with the 5-4 decision, Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg wrote the dissenting opinion, and she read it from the bench, which is highly unusual for her, and she said basically, uh, this is now back in the legislator's court. So believe it or not, the House and the Senate both managed to create this bill called the Lilly Ledbetter Fair Pay Act, which was passed uh, just before President Obama took office and then he signed it. Amazing, they got something done, you know, working together. Um, so we were very interested when we heard about this and uh, we put together this anthology. Uh, we wanted to hear more about what women, women in the workspace, which we don't hear a great deal about. I hadn't, I hadn't heard that much poetry by women about their work experience. And so we were really interested in bringing together voices of women poets in the workspaces they occupy. And we were very fortunate also to have the enthusiastic endorsement of Lily Ledbetter herself, who provided a statement that prefaces the anthology. So you'll have a chance to look at that later. And now that we have a new, uh, a new administration in power, uh, with a lot of concern for the rights of everybody, uh, not just women, uh, worker protections and democracy itself, I think that the issues that we are confronting in this anthology are even more urgent. And as you know, also, April 4th was what's called Equal Pay Day, which is when uh, the day by which in the following year, uh, that's the day that marks the day uh, in which, on average, women have to work in order to earn what men, on average, have earned within the 12 months of the previous year. So it's taken women, on average, until you know a month ago to uh, earn what men, on average, earned in 2016. So that was uh, another event that we are marking right now. So what I think I'd like to do at this point is invite my fellow readers to come down and, and take your seats. And one of, our, one of our readers could not make it tonight. She was ill. That was uh, Katya Alexander. So I'll give a brief introduction to her, and we're going to read her poem together. Uh, our, our readers tonight uh, will be reading Katya Alexander's poem, and the other the other uh, participants, readers, are Laura Day, Yana Harris, and Holly J. Hughes, who all, each one of them has a poem in the anthology. And I'll introduce each of them individually uh, as they come up. But what we're going to do, I think, now is I'll tell you, um, Katya Alexander is a Seattle poet she is a writer, actor, playwright, and teaching artist who has been recognized by Youth Arts Awards as well as a City Artist Award from the Office of Arts and Culture of the City of Seattle. She's been a writer in residence at Hedgebrook, which is an amazing feat these days. You know, Hedgebrook is over on um, Whidbey Island. She is a playwright. She has written um, Black to My Roots, African American Tales from the Head and the Heart. Uh, that was presented at the uh, Edinburgh Fringe Festival. And she has been the literary director for the Brown Box Theater, which is an African American theater company here in Seattle. And so she's written a great deal in theater. And she also performs her work uh, at, um, a Starbucks, the Starbucks in Madison Park, once a month. And uh, I hope to get over there at some point and hear her tell stories and, uh, and perform. So she's a, a member of the African American Writers Alliance and Seattle Storytellers Guild. So what we're going to do is read her poem uh, sort of as a, as a choral piece. We're all going to take turns reading it. So I'm going to pick up the, is this mic working? Is it on? Very good. All right, I'll come over here and sit down. All right. So um, this is her poem called Nana. Nana was her grandmother, who was a, you know, a rural agricultural worker who spent much of her life 
from very young working in the fields, uh, including picking cotton. So this is a poem in the voice of Na Na picking cotton, working her day in, in the fields. She wake up in the darkness, the darkest hour of the day, just before the Lord come and roll the nighttime away. She the color of night, her skin stretched tight across her face, and the veins on her hands tell the whole story of her life. She hides her gown up over her head, and she gets dressed in the dark. She run her hand over the few strands of hair she's got left. Then she tie a head wrap around it, and she put her straw hat on to protect herself from the scorching heat of the sun that she knows coming. She eats biscuits and molasses for her first meal. Then she gets the beans and cornbread in the tin that she carry out to the fields for her lunch. Pretty soon, she know the cotton picking truck is gonna be coming. She's running late this morning. So she knows she needs to hurry. It's already after three o'clock. She's usually ready by now. She puts her hands on her back and she stretches herself out. She's gonna be bent over all day long. Her knees is already creaking. She thanked God that she's got knees but still able to bend for him. She flexes her arthritic hands and rub the rheumatiz in her knees. Then she get her cotton sack from behind the cupboard where she keep it. Work is her salvation in heaven above and down here below. Work is the only thing that she done ever knowed. She thanked God she can work for as long as she able. She go to work when she three to help put food on the table. That's when she first start chopping cotton. Her mama made her a little hoe and she done worked ever since. That was a long time ago. She put her stockings on and tie a knot at her knees. Then she put on her brogans, run over at the heels. She go sit out on the porch and wait for the cotton truck to come. In the sky, she look for the first thing of the first tinge of the, sun, of the sun. But the sun is still sleeping, ain't got no need to come up yet. Ain't nothing out this early but colored folks and the white folks who carry them to work. The sun come up when it please. She ain't never in her life done wake up with such ease as the sun rise in the morning. She think about that song that say, that lucky old sun that ain't got nothing to do except roam around heaven all day. Going in and out the rows, that song seemed to carry her on through the day, even when her back is breaking. When the strap digging and the cotton sack she hauling is weighing more than she do. She always picks more than 800 pounds. She a little bitty woman, no bigger than a 10 year old child. She fly through the rows, which is longer than a mile. Her hands flying through the bowls, sweat falling in her eyes. She wiped the sweat off her brow with the kerchief round her neck. She pick her first hundred pounds before the sun even up. By the time the sun hangs straight up in the sky, she be near 500 pounds and so tired she almost crying. Some folks try to trick the scales, put dirt and rocks in they sack, but she proud that she always do a honest day's work. So that is Katya Alexander. Please thank Katya, everybody. <laughs> okay. And our next reader is going to be Laura Day, who is 
right next to me there. She is an enrolled member of the Eastern Shawnee Tribe of Oklahoma and a lifelong resident of the Pacific Northwest. Her mother was a carpenter who broke barriers as the first journeywoman carpenter in Seattle uh, after World War II, after many women had left the war effort jobs and returned to the home front. Right? Uh, Laura studied creative writing at the University of Washington and at the Institute of American Indian Arts in Santa Fe. It's a great place. And her chapbook, The Tecumseh Motel, appeared in Effigies 2 in, by Salt Press. And her first book, which is here on the table for sale, is Tributaries from the University of Arizona Press, 2015. And uh, she teaches public school uh, in Bellevue and lives near Seattle with her husband and son. So please welcome Laura. Hello, thanks for coming out tonight. Um, it's true, uh, my mom was actually the first uh, journeywoman carpenter um, in Seattle, and she was working in the 1970s. So there was a long period during World War II when there were a lot of women who were working in um, what was then called sort of non-traditional fields. But after that, it was very, very hard to break into those industries. And um, I'm very proud that my mom was one of the first ones. And I think that that uh, sort of um, kind of wonderful example led me into my profession, which is teaching middle school. Um, although there are many women who are doing wonderful work, um, it still requires great courage <laughs> and dedication, <laughs> and you have to be able to face the day um, in unpredictable ways as well. So. I'm going to read a poem that my students inspired. I've actually been teaching 6th, 7th, and 8th graders for the last 13 years. And um, grammar is, as many of us remember, not really a fan favorite. <laughs> so it's really, really hard <laughs> to teach kids that age why we care about language and how it's used. And one day, a couple of years ago, I was trying to teach students to understand the difference between passive voice and active voice, and why we want to care about that. Now, really, a teacher's primary job in this day and age is to encourage critical thinking. So when I had one of my loudest and most boisterous students say, why does this matter and why should we care? Um, that's exactly what you want as a teacher. And he really inspired me to think about why does this matter and why should we care. Now at the same time, I was doing a lot of research into language and how it's used in um, the US government's conversations, apologies, and written documentation in its encounters with the sovereign indigenous nations of this country. So. I thought about passive voice, and I thought I'd give my poem this particular title, Passive Voice. I use a trick to teach students how to avoid passive voice. Circle the verbs. Imagine inserting by zombies after each one. Have the words been claimed by the flesh-hungry undead? If so, passive voice. I wonder if these sixth graders will recollect on summer vacation as they stretch their legs on the way home from Yellowstone or Yosemite and the byway's historical marker beckons them to the site of an Indian village where trouble was brewing, where after further hostilities, the army was directed to enter where the village was raised after the skirmish occurred, where most were women and children. Riveted bramble of passive verbs etched in wood, stripped hands breaking up from the dry ground to pinch the meat of their young red tongues. So, the next thing that I wanna do before I begin to 
Um, I'm going to read a couple of other poems that I really admired, but I was kind of thinking about the great privilege and also challenge of reading other poems that you admire. Um, it reminds me of holding somebody else's baby. <laughs> you really want to, or I always do, but you also, you get a little bit frightened. You don't want to drop the baby. You want to make the baby smile and laugh. And that reminded me, um, I did meet my husband in Santa Fe, and my husband is Tewa. So I have had the really wonderful opportunity to learn about his tribal nation. I'm Shawnee, so that's an Oklahoma tribal nation. So we come from these very distinct uh, cultural groups with a lot of different traditions. Now, in the Southwest, there's this really beautiful um, tradition where the first person to make a baby laugh, it's this honored position. So if you make a baby laugh for the first time, you play this really significant role in their life. However, <laughs> you also pay for this huge party <laughs> and that everybody can come to. And so sometimes people will say, has this baby laughed yet? <laughs> and then if they haven't, they'll say, Not, I don't want to hold it. So, um, you know, I just, uh, I'm really honored to be able to read um, a few of these poems that I admire so deeply in this anthology. And hopefully, you know, we can make the baby laugh and not drop the baby. Um, <laughs> So the first uh, poem that I'd like to read, um, I thought it had such fantastic and beautiful arresting images and such a, a deep and immediate sensation within the body. This is um, Diana Garcia's Cotton Rose Cotton Blankets. Sprawled on the back of a flatbed truck, we cradled hose, our minds parceling rows of cotton to be chopped down by noon. Dawn struck in the air, blackbirds rang in the willows. Ahead, a horse trailer stretched across the road. Braced by youth and lengths of summer breeze, we didn't give a damn. We'd be late, we joked, stalled by a pregnant mare draped in sheets. Later, backs to the sun, bandanas tied to shade our brows, hands laced with tiny cuts. Later, when the labor contractor worked us through lunch without water. Our dried tongues cursed that mare in cotton blankets brought to full in the outlines of summer. And um, finally, I'd like to read Jennifer Clements, William Herschel's sister, Caroline, discovers eight comets in the Fahrenheit of my pulse. I feel their dust tails, hear them rustle in my fringed sleeves, shaped like F-clefs, ribs stitched. I have found the new lights. On cloud white evenings, I draw fish hooks, draw the eye, shank, gap, throat, bend, barb, point, and polish the telescope Rest my eyes, wait. Whatever the sky gives me, I will take. Thank you, Laura. That, that is a wonderful story, a wonderful bit of lore about making the baby laugh and paying for the party. I love that. I love that. Thank you for sharing that and for your own poem and the two other poems by Diana Garcia and by Jennifer Clement. Um, our next participant reader is going to be Jana Harris, who is uh, originally born in San Francisco but raised here in the Pacific Northwest. And she worked for six years as the director of the Writers in Performance at the Manhattan Theater Club in New York, which is when I believe I first knew of you. I think I had, I wrote you a letter, you know, I typed it on a typewriter, a manual typewriter, and I sent it to you all those decades ago. It was amazing. Um, but now Yana lives uh, with her husband in the Cascades, in the foothills, where they raise horses and uh, trains and uh, studies, c competes in uh, equestrian dressage, which is like horse ballet. It's really beautiful. She is the author of several collections of poetry and also 
uh, books of prose. Uh, her poetry includes Manhattan as a second language and the dust of everyday life, an epic poem of the Pacific Northwest, which concerns the lives of forgotten uh, women pioneers here in this part of the country. Uh, her new book, which we have here uh, out on the table, is You Haven't Asked About My Wedding or What I Wore, Poems of Courtship on the American Frontier, and that's from University of Alaska Press. Uh, Jana is also the founder and editor of Switched on Gutenberg, which is one of the first and uh, long-standing online poetry journals in the English-speaking world. And she also teaches poetry online for the University of Washington. So please welcome Yana Harris. Thank you. So um, I've been reading Frontier Women's diaries, reminiscences, letters for about 30 years. And because I live on a farm, I was, I was looking for inspiration. But what really leapt out at me is that their concerns of, of, in the 19th century were very much still our concerns today. Number one, they were concerned with equal work for equal pay. But even before that, they were just concerned with getting paid. Uh, often, you know, they, they were not ever encouraged to work away from home. But if they did and if they had to, their wages were not given to them. They were given to their husband. Because um, what would they do with money, you know? Um, the, another concern was childcare. If they ever had to leave, there was there was no childcare. So the debate wasn't, should you tie up your kid in the barn? It was how to tie up your kid. Um, you know, do you tie it to the wagon wheel? Do you tie it to the bedpost? Um, do you tie it to, uh, uh, I don't, you know, um, the chair, that was it. Um, and then the other alternative was to lock it in the barn where it can contemplate its past sins. And if you're really desperate, you did both. You tied them up and put them in the barn. And then the third concern was, uh, as we are today, about addiction, mainly uh, at this time in the 19th century, alcohol and opium. You know, they didn't have a lot of money, but anybody could make alcohol, um, Applejack, uh, fermented anything. Opium was, was a little harder to make, so it wasn't quite as rampant as today. So I want to read some of the poems by, um, in the voice of Helen Hodgson. She was born in the 1860s. She came across trails of Western migration and settled first near Pilot Rock and then married someone who had a newspaper in Olympia. And in the first very short poem, she's thinking about her mother's work. Uh, her mother in 1857, um, immigrated, migrated from Kentucky to Ohio. I often think of mother's wedding, a Kentucky girl, 15, clearing land, burning willow swags, working ash into soil, then mixing seed and sand before sowing. At harvest, tobacco leaves large as children pulled and hung upside down, dried, cured, stitched into hands. Late spring brought late floods. Hail ruined what crop remained. Fleeing to Ohio, her people surprised to find land so wide and empty without church or store. And here she is, all grown up in Olympia. It's 1890. A new house meant I must take in piecework for our temperance newsletter. The echo, and because I'm the one of the few who knows shorthand, transcribe election speeches using the juice of Oregon grape as ink. Tedious work, but buys the June perfume of trillium, sweet pansy faces and dog tooth violets on the shade side of our cottage, where my babies, Eli and Sarah, sleep in dry goods boxes safe from flies. And here's the baby Sarah, all grown up. Her actual, her given name was Temperance. Uh, she lives now in Spokane Falls. 
Husband Howard, and it's 1910, Husband Howard gone all day to the bank, golfing on weekends. I used to caddy for father, but wives aren't allowed. In high school, I'd wanted to nurse, but father feared the naked bodies of men would spoil me for marriage. At the university, I took a normal degree and taught near a dying silver mine. Wild cattle ran out of bunch grass hills through sea of mud streets to the river. Nighthawk City, not one painted building. Some scholars came to school hungry and without lunch pails. One girl never wore shoes or coat and coughed so loudly I couldn't shout over her. Another couldn't see the slate no matter how large the chalk letters. I took my scholars down to the creek and cooked fudge every day for a week. Accused of stealing sugar, I was fired, sent home to Olympia, where I set newspaper type. After too many proofreading errors, mother said I was so keen with numbers I ought to keep the books. Making bank deposits, I met my husband. So when the, the characters in this epic poem are fictitious, but all the events are real. And when I first read uh, of a woman, a, a young teacher in Nighthawk, which is in Northern Okanagan County, being fired because uh, she took her scholars down to the creek and cooked fudge, not for dereliction of duty, but because she stole the sugar. Um, the backstory is that the, they were upset about the sugar, not because they weren't going to have cakes and pies, but because it was destined for a uh, illegal still run by one of the school board members. <laughs> All right, so what other professions were open to women in the uh, 19th century? Well, here's one about the obvious one. This is by Penelope Shamby Schott. And how are you gentlemen on this fine fall evening? In the gaslit parlor, five young ladies on love seats, satin evening dresses reflected in gilt frame mirrors. A discreet bell. Madam opens the panel door. Whiffs of cold creep from the hall where two gentlemen lift their hats, unwind their knitted mufflers. The neatly pearled rose worked by wife or fiance. Everyone smiles. The two brunettes, the redhead, even platinum Miss Lily tossing her curls like a dare. A genteel soiree. Nobody mentions money or sex, but hips touch, a hand wanders, corks pop, just so much. Even the most ardent gentleman cannot perform impaired. Time is money, the fellows choose. The banister up to the second floor has been polished by sweaty hands. Discreetly, let us close the upstairs bedroom doors. The peephole looks in, not out. And because I live on a farm, I had to read this one. By Linda. Hazelstrom, Clara in the post office. I keep telling you, I'm not a feminist. I grew up an only child on a ranch, so I drove tractors, learned to ride. When the truck wouldn't start, I went to town for parts. The man behind the counter told me I couldn't rebuild a carburetor. I could, every carburetor on the place. That's necessity, not feminism. I learned to do the books after my husband left me with the debts and the children. I shoveled snow and pitched hay when the hired man didn't come to work. I learned how to pull a calf when the vet was too busy. As I thought, the cow did most of it herself. They've been birthing alone for 10,000 years. Does that make them feminists? It's not that I don't like men. I love them when I can, but I've stopped counting on them. No chain, I've stopped counting on them to change my flats or open my doors. That's not feminism. That's just good sense. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks very much, Yana. That was, that was great. <laughs> good sense. Yes, indeed. 
Ah, so, and, but it is, really, it is really great to have people in our lives of, of any gender, and if we can all work together, it's, it's wonderful. Our, our next reader participant is Holly J. Hughes, who is the author of Passings, Sailing by Ravens, and uh, also co-author of The Pen and the Bell, Mindful Writing in a Busy World from Skinner House Press. This is one of those wonderful books that really inspires us to, you know, look at our own work and, and write, write new poetry and, and get inspired to write. Um, and she's also the editor of the anthology Beyond Forgetting, Poetry and Prose about Alzheimer's Disease, which is from Kent State University Press. Uh, Holly uh, has taught writing at Edmonds Community College for more than 25 years, as well as at a number of regional conferences. And she also has spent 30 summers working on the water in Alaska commercial fishing for salmon skippering a 65-foot schooner and working as a naturalist on ships. And backstage, before we started, she was telling us how um, in those early days of working on the ships, uh, Gary Snyder, the poet Gary Snyder, was, was one of the uh, people who would come out and be part of the, these expeditions. So that was a, a nice reminiscence to hear. So let's welcome Holly J. Hughes. Thank you, Carolyn. Having put together an anthology myself, I know how much work goes into it, so I'm really grateful for all the work that Carolyn and her co-editors did, and I'm happy to be honored to be included in it. And it's also such a pleasure to get to hear the poems read by the people who wrote them. Um, I, I fall in love with some of the poems in this book, and it's just great to hear. This is the first time I've, I've heard Laura and Jana read these poems, so it's, it's really nice. Poetry is meant to be heard. It's meant to be read aloud. So the poem that I'm going to read does come from my, my fishing days, um, actually sort of post-fishing days. It needs a little bit of context, so I'll start with what took me up to Alaska, which I graduated from a college in the Midwest. I grew up in Minnesota, but I always had a dream of Alaska. And so after I graduated from college, I headed up there to make money for graduate school. And that um, summer, I ended up falling in love with Alaska and buying a fishing boat instead. And um, it wasn't what my parents expected me to do, <laughs> but thankfully they they recovered, and um, I spent four years fishing, gill netting for salmon with my college sweetheart. And um, it wasn't a good career choice, necessarily. I love eating salmon, but I discovered that I didn't really like killing them. And so when my husband wasn't looking, I'd slip them back overboard if they were still alive. <laughs> so not a good career choice. And um, we, but I fell in love with navigation, and we ended up running tenders for four years, going up all along the Alaskan coast, out to the Aleutian Islands, and it was a wonderful, it really satisfied my desire for adventure. Um, beautiful country, big seas, lots of storms. I, I got my fill of adventure, as a matter of fact, but got to see a lot of beautiful country during those years. I also had a lot of sea time, and so I ended up with my, I, ended up studying for a Coast Guard license, so I had a license to run 100-ton um, vessels. And so I ended up skippering this 65-foot schooner, and that's what I was telling the story about Gary Snyder. We had some wonderful people aboard in those years. It was a nonprofit organization called Resource Institute. And then, after that, I ended up working on a friend's boat, working on deck again. And the poem I'm going to read takes place after coming back to working on deck. It's interesting because the poem that I submitted for Carolyn's anthology is not necessarily about how difficult it was to be a woman in a very male-dominated profession, um, but it was something I wrestled with every day. Um, the, the collection of poems that I ended up writing out of that experience, Sailing by Ravens, um, is really 
uses the metaphors of navigation, and I fell in love with the beautiful, rich language of navigation. And it and this poem takes place sort of midway through the book, and the book is there's a narrative arc to it, um, and it I won't give the tell the ending, but basically I'm just learning to sort of navigate to make my own way. Um, so working on deck, here it is. Coil the line down against the sun, the old timers said, clockwise on deck. And 10 years later, my arms still breaststroke the familiar movement, loop upon loop, rolling the line a quarter turn against kinks feeling the resistance give way in my hands, stiff fibers yielding. The line knows how to lay if you let it. Now all the old loops come back and my hands swim down the line by heart and the line remembers all its lives, the past firm and its fibers, how they intertwine, coil upon coil, circling emptiness, all to make way for the next. In another life, I think I would have been a scientist. And I think that was part of the appeal of Alaska, the time on boats. From a very early age, I still can't explain it, except that I found out later my great-great-grandmother had, had married an English sea captain. So I, I guess I have it in my blood. Um, but I read Rachel Carson at a pretty early age. I read The Sea Around Us, and then, of course, later Silent Spring and um, just fell in love with the work of scientists, and especially someone like Rachel Carson, who is such a beautiful marriage of poetry and science, such a beautiful writer. And so I've written quite a few poems about women scientists myself, and um, this poem I'm gonna read is not one I wrote, but by Sarah Lindsay about Marie Curie, and I remember also learning about her in, um, probably in grade school or middle school anyway. Um, but I have written poems about Rosalind Franklin who helped, um, didn't get a lot of credit for it, but helped with the um, discovery of DNA, took the photographs that helped Watson and Crick figure out the double helix. And also Barbara McClintock, who is a geneticist. And um, this is what I love, it's a great story. Um, she has this wonderful line. She, she was studying corn, and she would go out in the cornfields at night and listen, which is not necessarily what most scientists were doing at that time. <laughs> and she said, you have to listen to, you have to have a feeling for the organism. Um, so anyway, I love that story, and I think it's important that we get more women into science, and I think it's important that we listen to what the scientists have to say. So that's my little political plug. Okay, this is Sarah Lindsay, Radium, and I, I echo Laura's words in being really honored to be reading um, this poem. His gifts to her were theory, patience, equilibrium, and a pile of dirt, industrial waste. He loved to watch his wife, aglow with determination, pursuing discovery of a hidden element past uranium by the light of her hunger. I should like it to have a beautiful color, he said. He would buy her boots to wipe at the Sorbonne. Heated, she leaned over a boiling vat, stirring her dirt reduction hour on hour. She looked like any skinny house fra, bent to her bubbling sauerkraut. She looked like the first woman who would be awarded a Nobel Prize, as well as the first to fall to her knees before a hill of brown dust shot through with pine needles and press her filled hands to her face. She boiled her tons of pitch blend down to a scraping of radium nearly the size of their baby's smallest fingernail, just the white, proof of its existence and hers. It permeated their clothes, their papers, peeled their fingers, entered their marrow, and slowly burned. He mildly alluded to rheumatism. 
He stroked her radioactive hair with a radioactive hand. Colorless, shining radium darkened in contact with air. Chemically, much like calcium, it would stream like calcium through her brain cells in her later years alone and make memories glow in the dark. Illegal schooling, unheated rooms, subsistence on tea and chocolate. Lying with her husband for a few hours sleep, cracked hands and weakened legs entwined, united gaze resting on the vial of radium salts they kept beside them every night for the lovely light it shed. And then the last poem, I chose because I left the deck of the fishing boat and traded it in for the walls of a classroom. As Carolyn mentioned, I've been teaching um, for quite a few years. And um, it has its challenges. And I think this poem really captures some of the sort of bittersweetness of spending 10 weeks with your students and then watching them walk out the door at the end. Um, some of them stay in touch, but a lot of them don't. So this is by Kathleen McClung, and I also chose it because um, I met Kathleen. She's a fine poet. She's a poet from the Bay Area, and she came up for the Write on the Sound conference where I was teaching and for a couple years and um, really enjoyed working with her, so I'm honored to read her poem. She tends to, she works in form a lot. This is a sestina, and I won't try to, I won't take the time to try to explain the sestina except briefly to say that there's a pattern of repeating words, and you might hear them. There's six repeating words. But it's a pretty seamless sestina, so you'll have to listen hard. Night school final. You murmur, chew nails, joke. Prepare to write in ways unique to each. Semesters end by rote. I stroll the narrow paths, dusk blurs to night. I hand you tests like maps, a hush. Then pens begin to dig, carve bark, or sprinkle slow, faint wisps of sentences. Some know, some guess. And I refrain from staring, as I guess you want trust, not suspicion, as you write. My gaze brushes, brushes each forehead, tender, slow, almost a mother's gaze as this term ends, and change knocks, quiet, urgent, at a door. Open and go, but first show mastery tonight. What must your labor prove to me? Two nights a week we talk of poems, soliloquies. We guess together, muse aloud, state claims. Your pens, I say, the tools of done, of rich, to write, mind, body, heart. To our exam at end may sift who's read from those who've not, but slow, absorbing, deepening, requires long, slow inquiry, lasting years beyond this night. We don't have years, we're temporary, end with stapler, backpack slung, a wave. You guess I will be fair with letter grades? You're right. Old school examiner, my aim, sharpen vision, equip minds for dilemmas pens have not yet shaped for study. Honor slow approaches, plural, not texting, to write what matters most. You 23 scatter tonight, we will not meet again. Oh sure, when I'm a guest at bistros, arcos, supercuts, our chat will end perhaps this way. I learned a lot. There is no end for learning, we'll agree. I glance at pens and faces now, full concentration, yes. This room, almost a home, almost dear. Slow the speed of cypress chanterelles, this night of harvesting mind fruit, this fertile right. My pen will forage slowly late tonight among the guesses, fresh and wild, you write, a tribe of thinkers in a forest without end. Thank you.
thanks, thanks so much, Charlie. That was, uh, that was lovely and very lyrical. The, the Sestina is one of my favorite forms. Uh, and if you have ever committed a Sestina, you know, you will find that you're going to be a repeat offender uh, quite frequently, which is wonderful. Um, I thought maybe uh, to conclude, I will take the liberty to read one poem in here by, uh, this is kind of a fun one, and it will sort of uh, ease us out eventually into parking lots where we, uh, where we need to go after this event is over. But I'll read this and then we'll have a little question and answer and then we can um, enjoy the rest of the evening and look at the books. This is a poem by Leslie Newman who lives in uh, Massachusetts. She's also known as a children's book author and uh, a motivational speaker. She was the author of Heather Has Two Mommies, which is a very uh, somewhat controversial uh, children's book, and it still gets banned in classrooms, which of course helps sales greatly. Um, this is a poem, I think, you know, many of us have had uh, sort of low-level office jobs, and I think this will give you a sense of one of those low-level office jobs. It's called Adjustment One, Shifting Piles. I, and, and you'll notice that the technology is somewhat older. You wouldn't be able to write this poem today because the, the movements are not quite the same. <laughs> I place a pile of credits to my left and a pile of debits to my right. After I type the numbers from the debits onto the credits, I pile the debits on top of the credits. Then I pull the carbons from the credits and separate the copies into piles. I interfile the piles and bring them over to the files where I file the piles and pull the files making a new file of piles. <laughs> then I make files for the pile that had no files and put them into a new file pile. I take the new file pile down the aisle down over to the table where Mabel makes labels for April to staple. I take the new labeled stapled file pile back down the aisle over to the file to be interfiled with the pile of filed files. After I file April's piles, I get new debits from Debbie and new credits from Carrie. I carry Carrie and Debbie's debits back to my desk and place a pile of credits to my left and a pile of debits to my right. After I type the numbers from the debits onto the credits, it's 10 o'clock, and we have exactly 15 minutes to go down to the cafeteria and drink coffee or go out into the parking lot and scream. <laughs> Thank you so much. This was, uh, this was a lot of fun here, but uh, if anybody has any questions, uh, how do we do this? You come up to the microphone. So if you have any questions, if you could come up to either this microphone or that microphone and ask your question so we all can hear you and we can also hear you on the recording of the event tonight. Uh, we have about 10 minutes for questions, so we'll see how many we can get through. I know you also have a couple of questions I to have pose. a couple of questions in case people are very busy filing piles or just, you know, uh, don't want to come up and all the way up to the microphone, but if you do, welcome. I'll look forward to hearing from you. Okay. Well, I have a, I have a question. I would like to ask this of each of uh, the three, and I also probably could answer it as well. Um, what, uh, in, in writing your own poems, did you gain greater insight into uh, the world of work or into your own workspace, uh, your own life as affected by your work or your work as it affected your life? Something like that. Um, yeah. Laura. <laughs> I... Um I think that working as a teacher lends itself really beautifully to um, being a poet. And um, I think one of the reasons that I feel they have this great interplay back and forth is 
you're living a lot of the time in sort of the land of ambiguity and the tension between unanswered questions. You have to kind of learn to let that um, buoy you from one movement to the next instead of being mired down in it. So you need like this great depth, but also a lightness. Um, so I think that thinking about my relationship um, between work um, as a poet and work as a teacher, it helped me gain a deeper appreciation for um, the kind of thinking that I do in both professions and um, also how much I sincerely enjoy uh, the work that I do. And um, so I think that it, it's, it was a nice moment of reflection for me to think about that. I think that um, I can only write in the morning between <laughs> 8 and 11. There's a particular time of day where my mind won't work as a writer. It'll work as a teacher, but if I don't get written between 8 and 11 in the morning, it's gone. Um, somehow I can read other people's work. I can do research. I can reread the stuff I've written and write it over 60 times. But as far as just writing the, the new, um, it's got to be first thing in the morning. So I, I, I guard that time. Um, otherwise, it just doesn't get I'm on the same time frame as you, Yana. I do the same thing. I try not to check email until 11, because once you check email, it's gone. Yeah, it's, yeah. But I want to, I'm going to go back to my fishing days, which was decades ago now. But I just want to talk about how writing helped me get through a, a tough time. And that I was keeping a journal all the years that I was fishing. It was a male-dominated profession. I felt very alone at times, and I, I just turned to my notebook, and I took a lot of books with me. And somehow, the reading other poets and reading um, and writing myself sustained me through all of that. And so when I put this collection together, a lot of it was just going back to my journals and kind of mining them. Um, working with the navigational imagery, but also um, I was grateful that I'd, I'd kept them. So just for anybody who's um, interested in writing, my, one of my little bits of advice would be just journals are really helpful. Thank you so much for, for those comments. I, I also find, I mean, I've done a number of different jobs. Um, one of the things in my bio is that I've done everything from hotel maid to um, working as a sales liaison for a biotech firm where I was calling patients actually in Latin America. So I had to ask them about their medication and their dosage and, and getting a new, uh, a new batch of product. And I had to speak to them in Spanish or in Portuguese, you know. Uh, and uh, I worked as a, a waitress in a, a restaurant in the U District called Pizza Haven, which I have written about. It's called Pizza Hell. That's what I call that restaurant. Oh, I was a terrible waitress. But um, I, found that, I found that being able to write about some experiences, and many experiences that involve a great deal of frustration or injustice, somehow being able to write about them uh, enables a, a, a new kind of lightness of spirit, lightness of being, uh, as we saw in Leslie and Newman's poem, as we saw in uh, even in Katya Alexander's, Diana Garcia's, where people were working under very harsh conditions, and yet they can produce, uh, or if not the, the person herself, Na Na didn't, didn't probably write, but uh, her granddaughter has come along and written a poem in her voice and has dramatized and created that, that difficult, lonely life. Uh, and, but also the brave spirit of that person. And uh, so I think that, and Diana Garcia, for example, is now a professor at University of California, Monterey Bay, but you know, she grew up working in the, in the fields. And believe it or not, that poem was a sonnet. <laughs> so um, I think our experiences in the world of work, and because that is a world that all of us enter in some way or another, we all have access to it, and I think we all um, can gain a great deal of understanding 
of our own lives and a new perspective when we write. So, so thank you. And I think we have a question. Yes. Um, well, I was thinking about putting together an anthology as work. I mean, it took a certain amount of collaborative effort, and I'm imagining that you got to know each other uh, th through the poems, for one way, and mm -hmm. there probably was some interaction. I'm just wondering in that, in that workspace, so to speak, yeah. what, what surprised you, uh, perhaps delighted you? Wh what are you taking away from that experience of kind of pulling all this together? Each of you probably had different roles, so that's my yeah. question. Well, I can, I can answer quickly as sort of the, the lead editor. I think I sort of instigated the whole project. And I was working with two other co-editors, Eugenia Toledo, who is a Chilean-American. Uh, she spent 35 years in West Seattle after coming up here from Chile uh, in the wake of the military coup that overthrew uh, Salvador Allende. And she was, by that time, a, a graduate instructor. She was teaching at a university in her hometown, Temuco, in the south of Chile. But she lost that job for political reasons. They figured she was a, a Allende sympathizer, so she got fired. Uh, and then she came here to do her doctorate at the University of Washington. But um, she and I were talking about, well, what can we do to, to talk about? We want to learn more about how women think about and write about their work. And so it was as much uh, a project of doing research um, finding out who was writing about work. I mean, I'd read a lot of, you know, read a lot of books of poetry in the course of my writing and found wonderful poems and anthologies. We also put out a, a notice in Poets and Writers and then word spread online uh, through various social media sites, uh, Facebook, etc. And we got wonderful submissions. And then there were other people whom I contacted. I knew of poems of theirs or I knew that they were poets who had written about you know, their working experiences. So I, I would find their email or I'd find some way to contact them and, uh, and then reach out to them and ask them to submit something. And that worked out quite well. And so I got to know uh, everybody because I was, you know, we were in email contact uh, over the course of a couple of years, mainly email, occasionally telephoning, but email's wonderful because you can, you can reach a lot of people and uh, at least on my email system, you can send to 50 people at once, one email message to 50 at once. Um, but I never did that. I was in, it was, it's a lot of, it's a lot of work, but it was a lot of fun because I felt like it was a big uh, room full of, of wonderful poets and um, many of them extremely supportive and helpful. A couple of them a little prickly. And that was also a fun study in human psychology. But I, I won't tell those stories right now. I, I will later, maybe, if anybody wants to hear. Some are quite amusing. But um, yeah, so let's hear uh, from Laura and Yana and Holly. Um, I think that something that I really appreciate about this anthology as a reader and also, I guess, as a participant is um, that it offers like so many rich counter narratives. So we have this vast diversity of experience, um, kind of life story. And I think that it sort of asserts itself as how, you know, as women we're part of this very rich tradition of sort of the, the grace of American work and service, but also of, um, you know, our, our really profound intellectual contributions. If you look through a lot of anthologies, you know, I'm not typically gonna be someone represented. I am a Native American, public school teacher. I do not have an MFA. <laughs> and um, so I think that being a part of an anthology that embraces these many, many counter narratives to create a, a whole picture, um, it was just a great pr privilege to be a part of and um, uh, something new and not something we see enough of, I think. Yeah, I agree. It really created a, a, a sense of community that I didn't, I was new, Carol, that, that I didn't know was there. Like, I got to meet you through your work, and I knew you through your work, and I actually got to meet you in person, and um, I, I used to work on fishing boats. And so there, there was this sort of commonality of experience
hard to be the third person. I just want to say ditto, ditto. But, but I also appreciated the diversity of voices and um, having edited an anthology myself, it was just amazing to me, both with this project and with the project I did, what a great sense of community can be established. Writing can be sort of a solitary act. We're alone in our little rooms with our laptops or computers. And so to have a sense of other people out there and then to be able to you know, meet on the page but then meet face to face, um, it's really nice to get out of your room once in a while. Yes, and so I think um, uh, the other thing that was interesting for me was the diversity of work experience that people had had. Of course, uh, one of the most common, or shall I say, I got a lot of poems submitted about what is considered traditional women's work, you know, teaching, right, waitressing, um, working in offices or even factory work. Uh, but it was more challenging to find poems about women or by women in the sciences, in law, in the military, uh, in, uh, in other, other fields that have been more male dominated, you know, high tech. And so actually many of the poems in the sciences, uh, as with Radium, Sarah Lindsay's poem, this is sort of uh, reflecting back on the life of Marie Curie and her husband. Uh, other poems, like Jennifer Clement's poem, is in the voice of Caroline Herschel, who was the sister of William Herschel, who was a, one of the early astronomers, right? Um, and so we had more poems. Some of the painters were uh, in the voices of Renaissance women painters. So, um, that was how we got access to the sciences and the arts and some of the more technical fields. Although we do have one really kick-ass lawyer in there. That was great. <laughs> uh, she was a country lawyer from Oklahoma, and she's retired now, but still, um, you know, being very active. So I, I was, uh, wanted to balance everything out and have representation from as many backgrounds and, and fields of endeavor, as many different workspaces as possible. And I think we succeeded to some, to some extent, and uh, I've been very pleased with it. And so if you have a, have a moment, take a look at, uh, at a copy, and um, we will sign them for you. And I think we have reached the conclusion of the program, and I want to thank you all very much for coming, and let's give a big hand for the audience. <laughs> <laughs>